Please have a Bible and have it uh, open in front of you, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, page 1047 in the Church Bibles. I wonder if you've ever heard of the man Rabbi Zacharias. You were not the best. Rabbi was an American chap, he was an evangelical minister. And he uh, particularly was gifted at defending the gospel at apologetics, it's called. He, uh, he had and led a worldwide ministry. And a ministry that was very effective for over 40 years in, in ministry. And God used him to draw people to Christ. <coughs> Rabbi died in, in 2020. And uh, before and after his death, many stories had come out of over the years of how he had abused many women. How he abused many women, he'd lured them in and abused them. The Christian minister. A man who seemed to be so effectively used by God, so so wise, so knowledgeable about God's word. Quite shocking. We don't have to be a, a relationship expert uh, to realise that the world has forgotten what self-control is like, particularly when we think of relationships. We live in a society that thinks we have the right to anything, and immediately. And if, if that doesn't happen, then there's often real problems. And of course, that spills into relationships. Sex before marriage is with branded old fashioned, with branded women. Same sex marriages are now not only accepted, but almost forced into being celebrated. And sadly, on many occasions, it's not just the world, is it, that celebrate them. On many occasions, Christians, even churches, have conformed to that way of thinking. Too often, the church seems to mirror the values and behaviours of the world around us. And one and main factor of why we live in such a society and, and the behaviour that, that comes with that is because we have a lack of self-control. And as we look at the passage this morning, we will see Paul explain, uh, that, and, and this is Paul's main reason, the motive why we should exercise self-control, and we will see it in our passage this morning. But as I said, too often the values of the world are creeping into the behaviour and lifestyle of the church. We will see in our passage that we are called to live distinctive and set apart and holy lives, different from everybody else, with different motives, different purposes. And as the pressure to, to conform to the world will only increase, we need to hold on to passages like these. So with that in mind, let's, let's take a look at, at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is, this is really Paul's uh, turning point in the letter. The letter hinges on, on the prayer just before it in chapter 3, 11 to 13. In the first half of the letter that we've looked through over the last probably two or three years, is, uh, is, is, is Paul has been assuring the Christians in Thessalonica that they are saved. He's been filling them with confidence that they are believing the true gospel right through uh, from chapters 1 to 3. And he finishes that kind of section with this prayer in chapter 3, at the end of chapter 3, of thanksgiving and encouragement for them to abound in love all the more. And we come to chapter 4, and, and Paul kind of changes his tact a little bit with, uh, with what he wants to tell them. Paul is aware that in the, in the church there, that there are some uh, certain areas of church life that really do need attention and need teaching. Areas that need growth and godliness and understanding. And so in the second half of, of Thessalonians, we, 
we see that Paul turns to telling them, he, 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 he tells them in the first half, sorry about their saving faith, in the second half, he tells them of how they should live for Christ. So that they're saved in Christ in the first half, and how they should live for Christ in the second. Because trusting in Christ will always lead to obedience of his word. So look with me at verses 1 and 2. We ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus Christ, that as you have received instruction from us on how you should live, and please God, as you are doing, do this even more. Do this even more. It's worth remembering, as I just said, that Paul has spent so much time assuring them that they are saved through faith alone in Christ alone. If we were to read this letter through as a whole, we would, we would see and it would be engraved in our mind of exactly that, of how we are saved. And now he comes to, to, to chapter 4. There's no doubt in their mind, or there can't be any doubt in their mind, that, that Paul's instructions here no way contribute to their salvation. There's no way that they could uh, make that assumption. Their faith is in Christ alone. But here we see the result of what that salvation should look like. As on most occasions with Paul, uh, these instructions that he gives come after he has already lived with them. He's already lived out. He's already given this example to them. And this is simply just a reminder really of, of, of how he lived amongst them. He said, remember how we live, how Paul and Timothy lived. Even though these uh, Thessalonians, Paul had given these Thessalonians this instruction, it isn't a rebuke. It isn't a rebuke. He says, continue. He sees some positive in there with Timothy's report when Timothy came back. And it isn't a rebuke to them. He says, keep going. He sticks with his encouraging father role in chapter 2, where he tells them, I was an encouraging father to you. He recognises that they're already pleasing God in some areas and urges them to carry on. Sometimes when uh, Steph and I are explaining to Noah how to respond when Lydia breaks a toy or snatches something from him, we will try and use examples of our behaviour to encourage him to do the same. Like when Steph, Steph knocks over my towel and scribbles on my elephant <laughs> and how I react. But when we're teaching people how to live, the best place to start is often by showing them, giving them an example of our own actions. And that is exactly what Paul is doing here. He doesn't want them to be stagnant or, or drift. He urges them to, to keep on pleasing God. It's the one thing that should always be on their minds. Keep on pleasing God. Whether that be in their, their church life or their home life or at work or when they take the kids to the park, the outworking of their Christian faith that he's gone on about in, in the first three chapters, the outworking of that is to please God in their lives. So the question beckons, how? How do we do that? How can we please God? Well, the answer in, in some ways is simple. It's when we have trusted in the living word, when we have trusted in Jesus Christ, the living word, we please God by obeying Him in the written word. By obeying the words that He's given us, the Bible. When we're trusting the living word, we please Him by obeying the written word. In verse 2, the Apostle Paul reminds them that the instructions He's given them is with the authority of Christ. The verses that follow aren't simply kind of take it or leave it advice from, from man to man. They, are, they come with, with Christ's authority. Sometimes time you may come across people and Christians who, who hold Jesus' words in the Bible with more authority than, than maybe the Apostle Paul's or the, or the Apostle Peter's. And they may be willing to, to kind of leave them on the wayside and, and, and just focus on Jesus' words. But Paul's here saying, the Holy Spirit's here saying, that's not the case. We can't do that. Now these words come with, with the Lord's authority. 
The Word of God is one book, one of many authors, all inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we see that at the end of our passage in verse 8, Paul says, consequently, anyone who rejects this is not rejecting man, they're not rejecting me, he says, but God, who gives me his Holy Spirit. These words are inspired by the Spirit, and Paul is a messenger of God. God says, if you reject my word, you reject me. You can't trust in the living word and reject the written word. They're inseparable. And that's why the fruit of a, of a true Christian, the sign of a true Christian, isn't, isn't simply a, a prayer said at a meeting, although of course that's an encouraging way to start, but it's their obedience to the word. Only God can, can see the heart, only he knows the truth, but his word tells us that out of the mouth produces what the heart is full of. If our heart is filled with the Spirit, we will see the fruit of obedience to his word. But graciously, God doesn't leave us on our own to He gives us his spirit, as Paul says in verse 8, to help us. When we trust Christ, when we're born again, we're given his spirit. So please, God, Paul says, by obeying Christ's word through the power of the spirit. Every time we obey his word, Every time we obey the Bible, the Trinity is at work. Please God, by obeying Christ's word, by the power of the Spirit. But remember, if we reject the word, if we pick and choose a little bit of the word, then we aren't simply rejecting Paul, but we're rejecting God. So as we look at verses 3 to 7, with some very practical advice of how to please God. Let's remember that these are Paul's words, these are, these are God's words. And Paul's main point in these, these verses 3 to 7 are to be holy. To be holy. In verses 3, we have God's will for our lives. For this is God's will, he says, your sanctification. And then in verse 7, We've got to call our God's invite, if you will, for our lives to live a life of holiness. And then two words, commentaries tell me sanctification and holiness are, are the same word, they have the same meaning in this passage. To be set apart for God, to, to live for God with a particular purpose. Jim hasn't preached for a couple of weeks now. Uh, due to COVID, and I know that you're missing his football illustrations. It's terrible. But this one isn't uh, proper football. I thought I'd do it for James, who obviously isn't here again. But um, this one's American football. In American football, you have a group of players who come on the pitch when your team has the ball. They're called the offense. And uh, they, they are there, they play, they make plays whenever you've got the ball. And then when you lose the ball, all the play stops, and you have another group of players from the same team that come onto the pitch, and they're called the defense. And these offense and defense will, will constantly swap throughout the game, depending on who has the ball. That's it for football myself. <laughs> but, uh, but that's the case in American football. And of course, they will jump on each other and tap each other, and high five, and chest pumps, and all the rest. But amongst all the, the argy-bargy of the offence and defence trying to get an upper hand on each other, there is one player that always sits on the sidelines. He's still part of the team, but he always sits on the sidelines. He never gets involved in any of the plays. He's not part of the offence, really, and he's not part of the defence. He never scores touchdowns, he never makes a tackle. He is set apart from the rest, he has a different role. And he's only ever brought onto the pitch a few times, again, and only for a few seconds at each time. When he walks onto the pitch, everyone in the stadium knows what's going to happen. He's distinct from the rest of the players. He looks the same, but yet he doesn't join in with all their, their antics. He is the one 
that kicks the ball. And he's the one that kicks the ball. And that's all he does. He does one kick, and then he goes off it. Everyone else jumps on top of each other and does all the usual stuff that all excited Americans do. You say that when James isn't here. And he has one job. And as a Christian, we're called to be like a field goal kicker. We're set apart from the rest. We're given a different role. We have a different purpose for our life. And it should make us distinct. It doesn't mean we should separate ourselves from everyone all the time and go and live in a, in a monastery somewhere. The, the goal kicker is still friends with the rest of the team. He's still part of the team. He celebrates them, and with them when they win and lose with them. But he's different. It's a different purpose. God's will for our lives, Paul says, is to be sanctified. In some respect, we're sanctified at our conversion when we first trust in Christ. And as we grow in holiness, as we grow in obedience to his word, we, we get the outworking of that sanctification. Many Christians, and I've, I've done it in the past myself, and I still do from time to time, but we toil over what God's will for our life can be. What is God's will for my life? What should I be doing? What's my main purpose of 2022? What does God want from me when I'm older? What, what college? Do I go to college, university? Should we be in this house? What's God's will for our life? Well, God's will is for you to be sanctified, for you to be holy, to be set apart, to live holy lives. He doesn't give us a straitjacket, which means you must do this, you must drive this car, you must only speak to these people, you must take this job. You can fill your spare time with, with reading books or, or riding horses. You can, you can work in a hairdresser's or a, or a space station. But whatever you do, be holy while you're doing it. Choose wisely which book to read. Be wise with your time. There are lots of ways we can encourage one another to live a life of holiness. But Paul zones in here for the Thessalonians on one main area. And one area that can often be a stumbling block, and it particularly was for the Thessalonians. Sexual sin is definitely an issue in Thessalonica. And even in the, in the church there, remember it's a, it's a relatively new church, they're relatively um, not so, so mature in their faith. But we can look at our society and see very similar situations as the Thessalonians faced. They came from uh, pagan, un ungodly backgrounds, the Thessalonian people, and, and Paul and, and Timothy went there to preach the gospel for the first time, and people were converted. There was lots of behaviour that, that, that wasn't right, that wasn't um, right for, for Christian living, and specifically in sexual sin. And amongst the, the pressure from the outside and, and the, the pressure from sinful desires, mixed with probably a little bit of immaturity in the church, it was causing many of them to fall. It meant that they had some big adjustments that they needed to make in their lives. And to help uh, drive this point home, Paul, he doesn't want to leave any risk of misunderstanding of what it means to be sanctified in this area. So Paul writes in, in verse 3, God's will, your sanctification, what, what does that look like? By like keeping away from sexual morality. Paul makes himself absolutely clear. In verse 5, he says, no lustful passions, even lustful thoughts. And then in verse 7, he widens the subject to, to all impurity. Any impurity which might lead to sin in this area. The problem didn't just lie with those outside the church. 
In verse 6, it's clear that there are situations of brothers and sisters wronging each other within the church. There's a lot to sort out. But we, we mustn't point the finger too quickly. We mustn't point the finger. In my introduction, I gave some examples of, of Christians and churches in our own country indulging or accepting sexual sin. And we've got to examine ourselves closely, haven't we? We've got to keep accountable to one another. No lustful desires or impurity, Paul says. And it doesn't come without warning. In verse 6, in the second half of verse 6, because the Lord is an avenger of all these penances, as we also previously called and warned you. Remember, Paul has already made the point in verses 2 and, and verse 8 that the, his words, inspired by the Spirit, come with the authority of Christ Jesus. Sin doesn't go unnoticed, it doesn't go unpunished. Paul's warning here that the Lord is an avenger of these offences, it isn't an empty one. Of course, our God is gracious. Through Christ, we can be forgiven. The punishment of Christ has been paid on the cross for our sin, paid in full when we trust in Him. But as we touched on before, the fruit of a, a true believer is their obedience to the Word of God. Obviously, not perfect obedience because we're still sinful, but a hunger, a motivation to obey. But if the desire of obedience is consistently not there in, in a person's life, then have they really trusted in Christ? Have they really grasped hold of the gospel truly? And the one here comes in verse 6. Paul's point is that you can't, you can't separate God's love and God's word. If we lose the hunger to obey his word, how much do we actually love? Lord Jesus Christ. How much do we actually love the gospel, the good news? Paul says, groaning holiness here is to avoid immorality. I will spend the last part of time looking at what Paul says the main practical ingredients is to responding to the call of holiness, particularly in this area. And we'll find it right in the middle of our passage. You'll, you may have noticed we've been kind of working from the outside in today. So verses 1 and 2 and then 8 and then, and then in from there. And right in the middle we have verse 4. That each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honour. What is a big part of being holy? In self-control. To live a life full of self-control is quite the opposite of the Thessalonian way of what they were they were from that renowned for. This was a, a sexually immoral culture which featured very little self-control. They were directed and driven by their lust. And so even though some of them had found Christ and some of them were genuine Christians, as Paul was reminded them. There was many aspects of their lifestyle that needed to change and meant a very conscious effort for them to change, hence Paul giving so much practical advice. And of course we can, we can take this advice of self-control in many areas of, of sin, can't we? Self-control not to join in with school friends that are spreading rumours. Or maybe it's self-control of our tongue. But Paul, Paul clearly focuses on relationships here, on multiple thoughts on purity. The world is full of, of, of lack of self-control, isn't it? Of lack of obedience to God's word. Some examples at the beginning of uh, my sermon were some quite well-known cases. 
or, or lack of self-control. But we're all in danger in one way or another. It can be easy to think that we can simply enjoy God's gracious gifts, enjoy salvation, yet ignore his word. That if we think we can ignore the written word or trust the living word, surely we can do it. It will probably uh, take a lot of imagining for Steph. But imagine just for a moment that I tell Steph that we're going out for a day next Saturday. Just me and her. Steph says that would be, that would be lovely. Let's, uh, let's pack some food and we'll find a quiet bench. Mm, not much quiet in our house very often, so we'll find a quiet bench and we'll come over to it and we'll, we'll enjoy picking it together. So I said, okay, let's, let's do that. You don't need to organise anything, I'll, I'll organise everything. And so the day comes round and we, we set up in a car and, and we end up finding, finding a car park that we just happened to come across. And then we, when we go and sit down on this bench and we look over the field, and Steph isn't too impressed because the car park we found was, was just right next door to the football stadium. And the, and the field that I found was, was a football pitch. And the bench that we sat on was shared with thousands of other people jumping on top of each other when, when the goal went in. And to top it off, the picnic was a lukewarm half-time party. Steph wouldn't be too impressed. She clearly stated what she wanted us to do. And I completely ignored her instructions and went off and shaped it to do what I wanted to do. And so it is with God. He has revealed to us, he's shown us, he's written it down on paper for us to read of how we can live pleasing lives to him. How we can live our lives to please him. If we then go and, and twist his words or or ignore them altogether. Go along with what society thinks. Maybe not agree, but, but not disagree. Not be distinct. Then we're not going to believe it. God's will for our lives is holiness, it's sanctification. This is what pleases Him. This is His invitation to His chosen people. For those who trust in him. Wouldn't it make a difference to our obedience if we remember that this brings the Lord joy, the Lord Jesus Christ joy. That living this way pleases him. It makes him smile. Just as, as Noah makes me smile when when telling him and giving examples to him time after time not to react when living destroys his jigsaw. It makes him smile. It fills me with joy. And he shows patience with her. When we look at God's word, wouldn't it make a difference if we, if we didn't look at it as a rule book, but as an opportunity to, to bring joy to our heavenly Father? If you have a Bible, just quickly turn with me to, to Galatians chapter 5. From page 1034 in the Church Bibles, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5, verse, verse 22. Quite well known verses. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. The law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, and envying one another. I thought a good place to finish this morning was by reminding each other that self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. It's a sign that somebody is filled with the Spirit, that they're in step with the Spirit. When we exercise self-control, keeping in mind our passage, when we exercise self-control 
in the area of sexual sin, it's a clear mark of the spirit in the life of a believer. And as we do so, we aren't left on our own to do it. But Romans 4, 4 verse 8, God who gives you his Holy Spirit, you give the helper, the best helper. Let's bring joy to our Heavenly Father, both individuals, as individuals and as a church. Let's bring joy to our Heavenly Father by obeying his word and living holy lives with the help of the Spirit. Let's pray together.